Well, good morning, everyone, again, and welcome to this morning's study. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all that you do in our own lives and um, for the time that we have each morning to open your word and to receive light for our feet. And we pray for one another. We ask, Lord, that um, you can help us to encourage one another and that the truths that uh, you will reveal to us, that we can live them and that uh, your angels will be around us, and that your Holy Spirit will continue to speak to our hearts. We ask for your spirit to be here now, in our minds, in our hearts, in our understanding of these things. And we pray that um, those watching this video will be blessed. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again. Uh, Dwight, thanks for taking the study yesterday. I only got to watch the first half and then I read through some of the transcripts. What would you think that the main point that you made yesterday was and how it relates to what we're uh, studying here in Daniel chapter uh, 12? Well, all Daniel's last vision. Well, the main point for us right now is that we cannot be indolent. We cannot be careless in the message that we are providing that if this message that we are going to provide has no relation to that which was presented from 1840 to 1844, then it is not in accordance with what our Heavenly Father wants to go out to the world. Yeah. So, so we can look at the, the history of the past. So first, like in Daniel chapter 12, it's going to address the scattering of the power of the holy people. That is right. the, first, the first 1260. And that becomes typical of our history, right? And, and specifically the history of Adventism. So as a precursor to what happens in our history is like for this movement is we have the scattering of Adventism that parallels the scattering that happened with the Jews. Right. And then you're going to have the papal period. Right. Right. The 60 of papal persecution. Now, that more closely relates to uh, the fourth generation, and then the time of the end happens in the fourth generation. So, so if we're going to look at the the, the papacy, uh, Thyatira, we're going to look at the seven churches. That's the history of Adventism from 1957 uh, to the time of the end in 1989. And in the fourth generation, the time of the end occurs, the arrival of the first message. And that message is the message of this movement, right? So then it's going to address here, you know, the 1290 and the 1335, which we will look at in more detail. So what we've, what we've looked at is that there's this message that was given to Daniel and that message had to do with the two 1260s, right? The 2520. Right. And, and, uh, so you have the first three generations, right? That, that we're saying that that happens, uh, that's going to be uh, in, I mean, if we're dealing just with Rome, that's the history during the time of Rome that you have the, the first three churches. But it still just relates that whole 1260 as well. And so the scattering of the three angels' messages from 1844 to 1957, that's, that's like the first 1260, right? That's how we're paralleling it. So when we deal with this movement, as we'll see, when we deal with the 1290 and the 1335, um, how these specifically relate to this movement. We know how it relates historically because that's just going to be Millerite history. So there's obviously a parallel in our history. Now, you had made some other comments. Uh, so one is you talked about, you know, the first thing was just your experience on Sabbath, hearing a message where, you know, it's supposed to be this really powerful message and all it was was uh, Jesus loves us. Yeah, it was nothing but a peace and safety message. Yeah, peace and safety message. Now, of course, Jesus loves us, but because he loves us, he gives us a warning message. And that message is the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Right. And then we can parallel it with what's happened in this movement with this emphasis upon Philadelphia. So then you have the discussion you were talking about going back to Ephesus. 
William mentioned that that the movement says that we're actually Philadelphia, you know, the, the final church, that if you're a Laodicean, then you're not saved. But actually, it's the message to the Laodiceans that is the final message to God's people. The, right. the message to Philadelphians is Millerite history when they're united under the proclamation of uh, the second angel's message and the first angel's message as well. But more specifically, the second angel's message where they receive where they go through the great disappointment. That's Philadelphia. And so we can say that. We've paralleled that in the movement in the proclamation of July 18th. So the message to the Laodiceans would be even of more importance after July 18th. If we think we're not Laodiceans, what are we? Deluded. Well, we're Laodiceans, right? Because Laodiceans say, I'm rich and increased with goods, you know, have need of nothing. But they don't know their spiritual condition. So we're Laodiceans, whether we want to be or not. That's that is the message that is given to us that we need to recognize this self-examination. And so, you know, when we think about the three angels messages um, and a lot of people in the context of Adventism today, they think of the third angels messages, the message about how much Jesus loves us. That's the way it's been sort of watered down into that context. But Ellen White's quite clear. It's the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. It's talking about our need of Christ in a way that we we often don't want to acknowledge. That is, people want to feel like everything is okay, and so we know that that's not the message that God is giving us at this time. If we want to think that we're all right and everybody else is the problem, that's not the message to the Laodiceans. And and this has always been a problem with Adventists, as far as my personal experience is concerned is that adventists like to talk about the pope the catholic church the protestants and and sometimes they'll want to talk about the adventist church but they're not going to include themselves in that right so wherever this apostasy and wickedness is it's not in them personally right so you know you 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 got the adventists who recognize you know that the world is evil and then you got semi-Adventists. They think that they're they're more advanced because they recognize the Seventh Day Adventist Church is evil. You know that sin exists within the church, and they think that that's a sign that they're okay. But in all of this, it's just a deflection from our own personal problems. If the problem is someone else, then I don't have to worry about myself. And, and it's, it's 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 human nature. It's the natural thing to do. There's nothing remarkable about recognizing sin in someone else you know so to me this is this is really a problem that we have within adventism within this movement within our own lives is that we don't want to acknowledge that the message to the laodiceans applies to us but it does right now at jones is really clear about that in the i think it's in the 1895 general conference bulletin that he talks about that. It could have been the 1893. But but the idea is that we're Laodiceans, and, and we have to accept Christ's testimony in that regard, whether we, whether we want to or not, we have to accept that. So what we've been doing here, uh, getting back to this, and I, there was some other point that came up. Oh, just dealing with Palmoni. So you, you spent, uh, just looking at the notes that you were talking about, the acceptance of power at this time, the use of numbers, which which we've talked about a lot. The thing that I think about with that was um, when Jeff presented um, that we didn't have to deal with dates or anything anymore, right? That we weren't going to be using numbers in one of the one of the studies. Daniel Fontenot basically rejoices with relief that we don't have to think about dates and numbers anymore. I don't know if anybody saw that part of this was quite a while ago when Jeff first started presenting. Uh, Does that surprise anybody? Well, and it's not just him, of course. Lots of people have that same sentiment, right? The idea of these numbers and dates. I remember when I first presented chronology in 2014 at uh, the camp meeting in Alberta. 
and people were unhappy about it because they said it felt like they were in school in math class and they never liked math, right? Now, yeah, I understand that. You know, there's topics we don't like. Um, a lot of things that we have to study in this movement uh, remind us of school. We're doing lots of history, right? In you know, chapter 11, we're going over history, history that, you know, in much more detail than most people would even do in school, right? I mean, this is a, a lot of history. But are we going to say, well, I don't really like history, so I'm not going to really study Daniel chapter 11? Well, the problem for a lot of people is, is that their time in school was colored by how they approached their history classes and also their math classes. Now, you combine the two, history and math, and some people get very up in arms. The, yeah. prob the problem that we have right now is, is quite simple. If we are unwilling to learn the lessons of the past, we are going to be repeating the failures of the past. Mm -hmm. Now, throughout these studies that we have been doing, I think it has become very clear that if we have no character development, if we are unwilling to allow the testing that must be done to prove our characters to occur, then we will not be prepared either to give a message or for the crisis that will be ahead. Now, the disciples had to be proved. Peter had to be proved specifically. John and his brother had to be proved. I mean, because what what was their name? What was the name that was given them by Christ? Boanerges, Sons of Thunder. Which means that they had a temper, right? Yeah, I, yeah that's my understanding. Okay. Now, what was John known as at the end of his ministry? Well, the disciple whom Jesus loved, um, but uh, the, basically the loving one. Correct. Now, you don't go from being someone with a, with a temper to being someone that loves and can love as Christ loved. Yeah. So the problem that we have right now is that with all, with these peace and safety messages, it doesn't show us anything that is necessary for us to pay attention with. I mean, if if all we're going to be dealing with is, oh, Jesus loves me, I don't have to do anything. I can go out and I can get angry. I can hate. I can tear people apart. I can do all these other things. I can spread slander. And yet throughout, all we're doing is tearing people apart. Now, mm -hmm. our situation within this, I mean, the message that Elder Jeff right now is trying to present is the antithesis of everything that he has presented since 1989. Because if we're no longer going to deal with dates, if we're no longer going to deal with numbers, then we are not dealing with anything in the manner that Father Miller did. And that's a sad situation. Yeah. So we have this parallel obviously with Millerite history that, that we're addressing. So, and, and we could put this with Adventism as well, with this movement. So we know that this movement has, so when, when it comes to Palwani, so this idea of, of time, the idea of numbers. So we have many Adventists who want to talk about God's love, but aren't interested in the 2300 days or 70 weeks or the 1260 or the time times and the dividing the times or, you know, any of this, right? An hour, day, a month, a year, anything that has to do with, with math. And then of course, history, right? History is not important. They're not interested in, in biblical history or Adventist history. And so now we're in this, this movement that used to proclaim these messages. And it seems to me like if we look at Daniel chapter 12 and we're saying that this is the message of the day, right? This is the message. It has everything to do with both history and numbers, right? Right. 
So the idea that we can rejoice in not not having to deal with this, it, it is the same parallel to that presentation that you saw on Sabbath in an Adventist church. Now, there was also a comment made uh, that there isn't really much difference than following uh, the Pope, right? What we see in the movement right now, right? It, it's basically the same parallel. I think Angela made that comment yesterday. Now, I know Daniel Fontenot would not like that statement at all, right? Because his focus is always upon the papacy in his studies, correct? Right. But if we reject the message to the Laodiceans, we reject the inability to recognize in ourselves the characteristics of the papacy. And, and we saw this in the studies on, on Friday nights, dealing with the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith, where we're reading A.T. Jones' statement. And, and we're going to look at that on Friday. Um, again, we're going to look at Jones' history and Wagner. We're going to address some things that, that I found that I want to uh, to understand. Now, one one of the things we know is that people criticize Jones and Wagner. In a sense, justifiably so. Jones and Wagner both had character defects. And and with Wagner, that defect caused his ultimately his, his his salvation. With Jones, I don't think that's the case. I don't think he lost his salvation. But it did affect his relationship with the church. And and there was a trap set for him. And I and I've fallen for that same trap as well. It is he was able to be vilified justifiably to some degree, right? I mean, I'm not saying it was truly justified, but because there are things in his character that he wasn't able to to address um, completely, it people could set a trap for him where they could then uh, nullify his influence. Uh, do you understand what I'm talking about? Explain, please. Well, he ends up getting his credentials removed. Okay. So he's he's in a situation where many people are now not going to listen to A.T. Jones. And that – now, could he have acted differently? I think that he could have. I think he could have done lots of things differently so that they couldn't have done that to him as easily. That is – in defending the truth, they set a trap for him that that he would fall into. And, and, and I can just, not par- comparing myself with Jones, but I'm just saying I've been in situations like that with, with the movement, for instance, in the situations where uh, they got upset with me in a study, right? So we had uh, the one with uh, Johnson, what's his, Mark Johnson. We had another situation there when uh, Colin was presenting. I fell into the trap, right? I could have just been silent. But in defending the truth, I got caught. And that was a trap that was set for me. Not that people themselves really understood what they were doing. And and that definitely uh, affected any influence that I had with many people in the movie. And the same thing happened to Jones when they took away his credentials and even before that. So sometimes in defending the truth, we can get caught in these traps and these things have happened. So we all have these defects in character. Now, God can can still use us, right, if we repent of those things. But we have to recognize that, that we haven't always acted in the correct way, even in defending the truth. So, I mean, I'm going to address that more, you know, on Friday night. So so it's not a simple it's not a simple thing to just think that that, you know, I'm right and other people are wrong. It's just not, that's not how things are. We all have things to learn. We all have made mistakes. All of us have defects in character. And this message, the message to the Laodiceans, this message, and, and is the message of Palmona by the message to the Laodiceans? I guess that's, that's sort of the question. I would think that it would be. Yeah. Now, how can we more correct, more closely align that what what other ways could we connect that just and it's not it's not some mystery or anything it's just pretty straightforward because we have palmoni in connection with what with numbers yeah and, and specifically mentioned in connection with the 2300 days which means history yeah and it's going to lead us to october 22nd 1844 to 
the great disappointment. And now we can say, well, when did the church become Laodicean, you know, in, in the context of the messages of the seven churches? And we always have to mark October 22nd, 1844. I mean, Philadelphia isn't going to go past October 22nd, 1844. Right. Okay. So Laodicea begins there. Now, of course, we don't recognize it yet. It's not going to be recognized as Laodicean. But because they fail that test, they are Laodicean, right? And first, when they when they first understand the messages of Laodicean, it's going to be James White. And he's going to apply it to what he calls nominal Adventists, right? So he's going to first apply it to those who end up rejecting October 22nd, 1844. So if we're going to apply Laodicean to this movement, we would have to apply it to those who reject July 18, 2020. The very ones who think they're not Laodicean. Does that make sense? Repeat that again, please. If we're going to apply Laodicean to this movement, we have to apply it to those who reject July 18, 2020. Agreed. And they want to they want to be Philadelphian. They say we're not Laodicean. That's the Seventh Day Adventist Church, right? That's that's their view. And yet they're actually doing the same thing as the church, right? I mean, we could say, well, you know, they're acting like the papacy, but they're really in it's it's worse because they have a higher profession and to have rejected the truth that they once proclaimed is much worse than to just have error and never have proclaimed the truth. So this is the situation that we are in. It's it's not pointing. The problem is not pointing, saying that they're the problem. We have to recognize that we are. We are Laodicean. That doesn't, when I say that, I'm not saying they are. <coughs> they are included in we, but we are also included in we. And we have to recognize this because if we make the same mistakes as the people that we, in a sense, recognize that they've made a mistake, if we make the same mistakes they did, it doesn't make us any better than them. So it, it's, I don't know. I, when I, when anyway, when I listened to the study from yesterday, I was trying to figure out exactly what it is that you presented that relates to what we're looking at right now. And, and I think that that's the main gist of looking at Daniel chapter 12. We come to the end, to the close of probation. And what we're looking at right now is the message that Daniel is given. And that's the message that we're given. And this message is the message to the Laodicean church. It's represented in these numbers and in this history. Well, here's our point. The situation that we're seeing right now within the movement is there are many that are choosing to follow exactly what the church has been doing that we've we've had heartache with, where they are casting people out or deciding that, you know, I don't want to listen to what this person has to say. Now, this has become a real issue because how many times within scripture are we finding those within what is to be God's denominated people deciding to cast out others? Did that happen in the book of Acts? No. But yet we do see many times as Stephen in his discourse before the Jews pointed out that they killed many of the prophets that were sent to them, in effect, casting them out both of the church and of life. Mm -hmm. Now, what we have been seeing specifically is there is no unity within the Seventh-day Adventist church right now. And it's and in its condition, there won't be unity, true unity. There is, yeah. no, there is no unity within the movement right now. And in mm -hmm. its condition, there will never be unity. So, well, and unity will come from the, heeding the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Correct. Which is an individual work. Now, were Ellen White, Elliot Wagner, and Alonzo Jones, were they united in the message that they gave in 1888? Yeah. Yeah, those three were, yeah. Okay. And what did the church choose to do 
once they heard and began to attempt to comprehend the message. I cast them out. Right. They sent Mrs. White to Australia. They sent Wagner to England, and they left Jones on his own. Now, how does this all relate with the message here in Daniel 12? As we have been studying, the opening verse with Daniel 12 shows us what's going to happen when Christ stands up, right? When does Christ stand up? Well, at the close of probation. Isn't that when his church has made herself ready for the wedding? Mm -hmm. That's when he can say to him that is righteous, be righteous still. Exactly. Now, our situation right now is we are just touching on the work that is needed in our characters so that the bride can come together, so that the Holy Spirit can indeed be poured out. Because are we looking, I mean, if the, if the close of probation has occurred, then hasn't the final work been accomplished? Mm-hmm. So if the final work has been accomplished, then hasn't the Holy Spirit already been poured out? Mm-hmm. Doesn't it mean then that a unity, a true unity has occurred before Christ stands up? Yeah. Doesn't that also mean that the characters of those that have come into that unity have then become like one. Mm -hmm. So in, in all of these situations, if we're not willing for our characters to be formed in Christ likeness, then we're not willing to come into unity. And if we're not willing to come into unity, we can never give a message. If we can never give a message, then Christ is being prevented from standing up to claim his people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you in, in the studies that have been going on on Friday evenings, Jones has been extremely clear. You have been pointing this out very directly. And if we're doing it in any other way, if we're trying to do this all through our own human power, then we're in trouble. Yep. And and we know, and I'm going to address this again on Friday, so um, we can address a bit more about Jones. So the one thing that we see is we see that there's this movement did not do what it was supposed to do. It didn't heed the council. Uh, both af- immediately after July 18, 2020, there's an animosity towards the message because it failed, right? So there was just people were pointing fingers, trying to find someone to blame. They set up a a fake committee to examine the matter because they obviously weren't open to look at any options other than what they had decided already. So that, that was just a pretense. And then many of the people who ended up on the right side, so to speak, after that still continued the same work that was done by that committee. That is not being interested in in numbers and dates, unless it had something to do with justifying themselves. So we knew at that time back in December of um, 2020 that they were having this study on Sunday mornings dealing with Daniel chapter 11, right? They're going to look at Daniel chapter 11. Now, they had an agenda in doing that, correct? Right. Right. They wanted to basically... Because at that time, you know, Trump had lost the election and they were trying, just like with July 18, what do we do with this Trump prediction? They were trying to find some way to to weasel out of responsibility for that prediction. That's the way that I took it. And I don't know if other people agree with me about what was happening with that study, But but they weren't really willing to look at it openly. Right. So it was it was sort of a controlled study with some kind of agenda in that study. Now, they're, they're, they're taking the position that if Trump loses the election, then basically our message was wrong, right? Just the same thing they did with July 18. And they weren't willing to look at anything that would show that we were correct in our, in our prediction. We just didn't understand what, how that prediction aligned with the lines. 
right? Because I took the position that we were correct in July 18, 2020, and we were correct in in the role that Trump was to play play in the lines. Now they they end up rejecting that, but we see December 25th, 2020, we see 187 days after the publication of the warning to Nashville, a bombing that occurs in Nashville right, on Christmas Day. And then on January 6th, 187 days after, let me see, I'm trying to see if I remember this correctly. That's going to be January 6th is going to be connected with, um, how did, how did we do January 6th? I think it had to do with January 6th and 16th and 20th. I don't remember now how it works for some reason. My too many numbers in my head. But anyway, we saw the January 6th is connected with January 16th that there was this, uh, structure that also showed that that was prophetic. So January 6th is part of our lines. Then we're going to have 187 days after July 18. And depending how you count, if you count inclusive, you're going to have Biden being inaugurated on the 20th of January. And if you just go a cardinal count, it's going to bring you to the sale of uh, the School of the Prophets on January 21st, 187 days after July 18th. And so we continued to have all of these structures witnessing to the fact that that these were part of our lines. And, and I've still maintained the position, I think other people agree, is that what God has been doing is witnessing to the correctness of our initial understanding of these time prophecies, except that we did not recognize that they were messages to us, that these were messages meant to convict us right they were they were not messages just to someone else they were messages to this movement to show us our condition so it would be the council of the true witness to the laodiceans that's what all of these numbers have been doing is they've been showing us our sins now people will keep saying well well we need to repent of july 18 prediction as if That was our sin, right? But that wasn't our sin. Warning Nashville was not a sin. What was a sin was the way that we were treating each other in the movement. Characters are the issue. Yeah, the character, our characters are the issue. Yeah. 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 So when somebody says, well, I believe God was leading us. That's not, that's not pride. You know, it's not pride to say God was leading us. It's pride to say God wasn't leading us and we were deceived by someone else because that becomes self-justifying. That's that's where human pride comes in. The embarrassment of failing in that prediction and finding somebody to blame. That is the problem uh, that we have. We want to blame someone else for our sin. And the Council of the True Witness to the Laodiceans puts the blame fully upon our shoulders, not someone else's. The Council of the True Witness to the Laodiceans is not a message about the sins of the Catholic Church or the sins of the Protestants or the sins of the Seventh-day Adventist Church or the sins of brothers and sisters within the movement. The Council of the True Witness to the Laodiceans is a witness to our sins, to our character defects, to the things that we have done wrong. It's not, it's not a counsel about the sins of others. We think we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And we are counseled to buy gold tried in the fire, right? What is that? What's the gold tried in the fire? What is it that how does that relate to what we've experienced in this movement? What's the goal tried in the fire? I've treated that as character. Okay, but it's character that happens through experience, through trials, right? Exactly. Okay, so it was July 18, 2020, a trial. Yes. Yeah, right? And we've had lots of trials in this movement. So God gave us this message to try us, to test us. It's a three-step testing prophetic message. So we need this goal tried in the fire and it's going to, that's what's going to make us rich. Okay. White raiment. We need the character of Christ, right? We need to manifest 
Christ's character in trials that that we have failed to do. But Christ offers us that white raiment, his character, and, and, and he wants to cover our nakedness. Right. Because we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. And then he wants to anoint our eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Now, we, we can understand that this, this idea of having our eyes anointed. We're blind, right? We need to have our sight healed. And this sight is going to allow us to see things in ourselves that need to change. It's not needed to see the sins in others. And, and as we look at all these truths that have unfolded to this movement, the purpose of them is to show us our sin, right? It, it's not to show us the sins of others. None of us need ISAB to see the sins of others. We need to see our true spiritual condition. When our eyes are opened, they're open to who we are, what it is that we have hid from God, what we have tried to hide from ourselves. And that's why he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So we have to repent, but we have to repent of the right things. If we repent of proclaiming the truth, say, well, it was actually error. That's not repentance. So if if we look at um, then what what's in front of us here, this document, and we try to to put some of this in here to the present truth. So we 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 look at what's Daniel 12, verse 5 to 7, we're looking at. And there's some things that we need to fit in. So we know that we've, we've addressed a lot of these things already. But when it says, how long shall be the end of these wonders? What is Daniel asking for? So what's the end? The how long? What is he wanting to know? The end of what? Of these wonders, of this secret. Wonders is that word, uh, Palu, 6382. So what does he want to know the end of? Now, of course, this is the angel asking this question, how long should be the end of these wonders? But it's kind of asking the question that, that Daniel has, right? This is, the whole purpose of this vision is to give Daniel information regarding what? What, what does Daniel need? What, if he understands the 70 weeks, he understands the 2300 days. What does he not understand? You're saying he understands now the 2300 days. So does that mean he does not understand the 2520? Right. That's what he doesn't understand is the 2520. That's the whole purpose of Daniel's last vision is to understand the 2520 because he's given the understanding of the 70 weeks, right? He's given the understanding of the 2300 days in connection with the 70 weeks. And in Daniel chapter 10, it says he understood the thing that is the matter, the word, the commandment of the 2300 days and that understanding of the vision. He's going to understand the Mara. That's, that's the 2300 days, the evenings and mornings. But he doesn't understand the 2520 fully. And, and that's what's going to be given to him. Now, he's been given the in chapter seven of Daniel. He's been given the, the time, times and a half, right, for the tra- treading down of God's people. He understands to some degree that this that the 2300 days are part of the chizom, that they're part of this vision. Jeff called it the snapshot vision, right? It's it's the, the panoramic the, view. The panoramic vision. Yeah, I knew I was saying it backwards. The panoramic vision, right? So it's 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 the whole vision from you know Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, both pagan and papal Rome, and then the final uh modern Rome, right? The manifestation of modern Rome and the threefold union, all of those things. So we have this 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 whole vision, but Daniel doesn't understand it yet. So as he goes through this prophecy of Daniel chapter 11, he's going to be given details connecting the 2300 days and the 70 weeks to these periods of time, the indignation. He's going to talk about the indignation. So an indignation is just another name for the 2520. Right. And there's the last end of the indignation is the 1260. For papalism, and obviously the first end would be this this 1260 years of paganism. So the question of how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? That word wonders is connected with palmoni, 
So why is why are we given that word uh, wonders in that context? Why is he going to say the end of these wonders? Pala or pale, right? This is a miracle, a marvelous thing, a wonder, but it's part of the word, the wonderful number. So he wants to know the end of these wonders. The end of these numbers. Okay. Yeah, so the end of these things that the numbers are showing, that is, Pamona is the wonderful number, or he's he's the number of wonders. That is, he's taking this wonder and he's numbering it. And so when he's going to ask for the end of these wonders, the angels actually ask him a question, right? One of the angels on one of the sides of the banks of the river asked the question, but it's still a question that Daniel is looking for the answer to, right? And we're going to first be given the first part, the time, times and a half to scatter the power of the holy people, right? So, so that first has to be finished. In Daniel's time, it is not yet finished. The Jews are not yet scattered. Now, if you think about it, where Daniel is, he's he's in the time of Cyrus, right? He, he's in uh, 536 BC. That's where he's having this vision. Right. The Jews are now, they, they've been scattered in a sense, right? They're, I mean, the northern tribe has been scattered. And... The Jews are in captivity in Babylon, but he's being told that these things, the scattering of the Jews is not yet accomplished. It's not yet finished. It hasn't ended yet. It hasn't ceased. It's still going on, right? So he's telling him this still has to continue and it's going to continue for 1260 years. Now that 1260 years is going to begin in 723, right? That's when the scattering of Leviticus 26 first happens. First happens for northern Israel. It goes back to Isaiah chapter 7. So he's not actually answered the question fully yet when he talks about this time, times, and in half. It, it's not, it's not the full answer. He's going to continue answering that question. Now, if we, if we try to put this into the present truth, so we're going to say, what shall be the end of these wonders? What would we mark? What are What is the question asking? How would we address it in the present truth application? What are the end of these wonders? So what would I put here as, so I'm going to say uh, the end of the prophetic periods, right? Because that's going to be what's being asked is what is the end of the prophetic periods, okay? Does that make sense? So if I'm going to say that that's what is being asked there, what is the question as it relates to our time? Because we don't have any prophetic periods after October 22nd, 1844, right? So that's where he's asking about the 2520 for Judah, in a sense. But he doesn't understand how it all fits together yet. So we have the understanding of chronological chiasms. What is what is the end that would be addressed here? Anybody? I had to step away for a second. So what? Exactly? Okay, so we're asking. Yeah, so we have uh, the end of these wonders. We're saying that the end that of these wonders is referring to the end of the prophetic periods. In That's the question that's being asked. Okay. And it's going to be broken into two parts. It's first going to give the time times and a half. And then it's going to give the 1290 and the 1335 as the second half, right? So it's okay. going to connect the two 2520s together. But but the question that's asked there historically is, what shall be the end of these wonders? When is when is this 2520 going to continue to? When is the end of the prophetic periods? When does the 2300 days end? You know, specifically, how does it end? But we would have to say in this movement, what would be the parallel to that. What is that question asking to us? Because we don't have any prophetic periods after October 22nd, 1844. So what would this, this end be? Now we already looked at the word uh, Kate's and, and we could count it from September 11th, um, 2001. And that's going to lead us to 
uh, February 11th, uh, 2021, one of Stephen's, well, Stephen's birthday, one of his birthdays, you know, but not that he has more than one birthday, but every year he has a different birthday, right? So it's going to be his uh, 52nd birthday, I believe. Yeah, his 52nd birthday, which is a symbol of July 18, 2020. So that that's what we did with the word Kate's 7093. Now we have uh, 6382. Now we know 6382, well, 633, uh, let me see here if I remember correctly. Um, so we did, can't remember what we did with that. Um, I can't remember now how we did that. I don't remember now. Uh, anyway, it, it'll come back to me. So we have this word, I thought it was connected to 6336, but I can't find that. Can't remember what date we started on. Okay, just, just answering the question without dealing with the number as a symbol yet, it's the 6382. The wonders. So we know we connected with Palmoni. So what is the question asking that's going to be answered for us prophetically at the end of the world? So when the angel says, how long shall be the end of these wonders? What is it that we are going, because it's not the 2520, because that's the historical application. So what is it that we need to know the answer to that's going to be given in these final first verses of chapter 12 to this movement? Does that make sense as a question? I don't know how to respond to that. Well, okay, so we have to think about this message. The book of Daniel was open. The little books opened. Right. right. So we relate this to Revelation chapter 10. So you're going to have this little book open because that's what's going to be described here. Right. This is the scene of Revelation chapter 10 at the end. Right. But this is at the beginning. So the the question of how long is going to be the prophetic periods that reveal Millerite history. So what is the parallel for this time that we are in? What is it that we need to know? Okay, so I could make it easier by showing that the end of the prophetic periods or the period from 1798 to 1844. So what what is it that from 1798 to 1844 is paralleled in our time? Is that what is the question um, is asking? 1989 to the Sunday. Now. Is that what Jeff taught about this movement? Originally, yeah. Yeah, and that's still true, right? That this message, the question there, is about 1989 to the Sunday. Now. Because what, what Daniel was being shown was Millerite history. And, and he's going to he's going to recognize that, right? He's going to recognize, okay, you're showing me the end of this, but he's still going to actually have another question, which is going to be about our history. He's going to ask about the repeat of our history. But at this point, the question that's being asked by this angel on the one side of the bank of the river, and that Christ is going to answer, is the question about 1798 to 1844. That's 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 what historically is being understood by this. But if we apply it to the present truth, that's going to be 1989 to the Sunday law. And it's going to be represented with numbers. So you're going to have these wonders and they're going to be numbered. They're going to be numbered by Christ. He's going to number them. And the question is asked of how long to the end of these wonders, the Pali. Palmoni is going to give the answer and he's going to give it as a number. So the one clothed, the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, which is Christ swearing by himself. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So it's, it's a double oath because he swears by himself. And of course, Christ cannot lie. Paul refers this it, to this in Hebrews. Right. When he swears by himself, it's a twofold covenant promise. Now, when he says it shall be for time, times and a half, he's dealing first with the first half of the, the 2520. Now, he needs to to address that. Why? Why does he have to address this first? I've sort of alluded to it already. 
But he has to address this first because, why? Remember, Daniel's in 536 BC at this time. Because in order to understand the 2520 correctly, does he need to understand that there's two halves of the 2520? Yeah, it's vital to understand yeah. understand that. Yeah, it, it's extremely important to understand the 2300 days. You need to understand uh, the two divisions, right? You need to understand the daily and the abomination of desolation, right? So he's going to be given more information on that. So right now, he's going to be given this, as we say, um, the 1200 years of paganism, that is the daily, right? So for the daily or, right? So it's the daily. He's first going to be given the daily. He's, he's not given the period for the abomination of desolation yet, right? I mean, he has been given it in chapter seven, but he's going to be given that there is also a 1260 for paganism. This is going to help him in understanding this. It's going to help the Millerite movement is going to understand these things. So this, this is going to be sealed, but it's going to be opened in Revelation chapter 10. The stuff that's being talked about here is being sealed. So we also need to know that this is sealed in a sense to this movement. Our own history has been sealed. That is, until we pass through the history, we can't understand it. And we should have known that. We should have known until we go through and repeat Millerite history, we're not going to understand Millerite history correctly. And then once we experience July 18, 2020, we should have recognized, well, God gave us this so that we can understand Millerite history. It was part of the unsealing of the seven thunders. But anyway, we have this 1989 to the Sunday war, and Christ is going to swear by himself. And then he's going to say that he's going to give the period for the daily or the 1260 years of paganism. And, and that's going to parallel the history of Adventism, the three generations. So we need to know, we need to understand the three generations of Adventism. That's part of what this movement is about, is understanding where Adventism has rejected uh, Adventism, right? So this movement is about a call to go back and recover what was rejected, to restore the old waste places, to build the foundations of um What's, what's the word? Of many generations, right? So we have to build the foundations of many generations. That's, that's, um, Isaiah chapter 57, verse 13 or 14, right? They that it be of you shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt build, raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called the restorer of the beast, uh, the restorer of the breach. The, the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing my thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, right, etc. Right. So, so that is what this movement is about: raising up the foundations of many generations and being a repairer of the breach in God's law, the Sabbath. So how do we how do we put that in here? So we got uh, the history of Adventism, the three generations. That's that needs to be understood, and the accomplishing to scatter the power of the holy people. That's the scattering of the Jews in five thirty until five thirty eight, and it's the scattering of the three angels' messages from eighteen forty four to nineteen fifty seven. So we have then all these things shall be finished. Now it says all these things shall be finished. Now we know of course. What are the things that are going to be finished? Why does it say all these shall be finished? It, it's, it's not dealing with the final end. Why is it saying all these? Could it be timelines? Okay. Um, so he, he's first going to talk about the scattering of the power of the holy people. And then he says all these things shall be finished. Now, it's not maybe the best translation. So we did look at this a little bit. So when you look at the word all six... Uh, 3605, that's just a common word. It means the whole. Uh, these, Allah, that means these are those, right? It's a common Hebrew word. But in it, it's the words finished, uh, that is to end, whether in transitively to cease, be finished, or perished, or transitively to complete, prepare, consume. It's translated often as accomplish, cease, consume away, determine, destroy, 
expire, fail, finish, fulfill, long, bring, come to pass, holy, reap, make, clean, riddance, spend, quite take away, waste. So they translate lots of translated as quite a few different ways in King James. Sorry for the black blank spot there, but it's just me looking at the definition. So so we have things being finished. That is, it's talking about the whole. The whole of these things shall be finished. Now, we know that that's not true just for the first 1260. So he, he's giving only part of it here. And that's why it, in verse uh, 8, it says, and I heard but understood not. Okay. Now, what I'm saying is that this is that uh, Daniel here and not understanding represents the people of God in Millerite history. So did they fully understand the prophetic periods that they were proclaiming the end of? So th these are important points that we need to understand about Daniel chapter 12. I'm going to go to Miller's writings. See if I can find it quickly. I know which paper it's in. It's in the lecture on the typical Sabbath in the great Jubilee. Let me see. What's his words? It's not showing it. Here it is. Okay, so this is uh, it was actually in a different paper. Uh, dissertations on the 1260 days of Daniel and John. Okay, so he's going to address the 2520 here. I'm going to go back and give some background. Okay. So he says, thus then, has this little horn of Daniel come and strutted out its short space of time, times, and in half? Thus then, has this little horn of Daniel come and strutted out its short space of time, times, and a half? But his dominion is taken away. And Paul's man of sin, who was then in the future, has been revealed. He has wickedly exalted himself above all that is called God. He has set in the temple of God, has been showing himself that he was God. But his proud looks have been humbled and his high titles have come down and he is no more God. And the heretic and the heretic fever has bleached his cheek and his consumptive voice, consumptive voice shows him on his decline. How can we help? How can we help believing? But we have another mystery to explore of the same time as the former. It is that which Paul has called the mystery of iniquity, which did already work is what Daniel calls the daily sacrifice, meaning the daily abomination. This, too, is to continue a time, times, and a half. This is something most Adventists don't know, and even lots of people in this movement don't know, is that William Miller is going to uh, tie this time, times, and a half to the first half of the 2520. Now, he doesn't do it quite correctly, but he still does apply it thus. So he says in, uh, so he quotes here Daniel 12, verse 6 and 7. One man said to the man clothed in linen, etc. right? The question, what shall be the end of these wonders? And the answer that uh, it shall be for time, times and a half when he shall have accomplished to scatter the people of the holy people. All these things shall be finished. He, Miller goes on, he says, this power which is to scatter the power of the holy people is a different one, quite from the one that we have been attending to. This scatters, that wears out. This treads underfoot that makes war against the saints. Talking about uh, the papacy. Uh, this carries us to the end of all wonders, that only to the end of the power of mystical Babylon over the kings of the earth. This alludes to literal Babylon and the kings of the earth, that to mystical Babylon and the power of the popes of Rome. Again in Revelation 11, 2, but the court which was out the temple, uh, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. This is the same 1260 years as the time, times, and a half, and alludes to the time of the Gentile kings would scatter the power of the people to rule over them. Uh, this was prophesied by Moses in the 26th chapter of Leviticus, and I will scatter you among the heathen and draw a sword after you. Now, I don't know if I quite agree with his, app. I don't agree with his application there. But anyway, um, so he's trying to attribute it. I think he's trying to attribute this to the period of the daily as well. Um, but I could be wrong, but it seems like that's what he's talking about, the scattering of the Jews. Uh, Smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. The high priest said, that Jesus should die for that nation and not for that nation only, 
but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. This proves the fact of the scattering of the holy people who will be gathered when the Lord Jesus shall come in the clouds of heaven and send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds of heaven. And then comes the question, how long to the end of these wonders? The answer was for a time, times and a half, both 42 months, three years and a half prophetic, which is 1260 years common. We now wish to know when the scattering of the holy people began. Isaiah prophesied in the year 742 BC that within 65 years should Ephraim be broken and be not a people. That's Isaiah 7 verse 8. 65 years from that time in the year 677 BC, the 10 tribes, including the tribe of Ephraim, were carried away and were never afterwards known as a nation. Now, he's incorrect here. Is it that in 677 that the northern tribe is carried away? When, when is when is the northern tribe carried away? 723. Okay. Um, yeah. So more. So technically, the northern tribe is carried away in 721 because the prophecy here is not actually addressing the carrying away of the northern tribe. If we read on in Isaiah 7. It's going to deal with the time that the land is forsaken of both her kings. So its first king is the captivity of Hoshea in 723 BC, two years before the fall of Samaria, right? So he's going to be carried away captive. And then two years later, Samaria is going to fall. And when Samaria falls, that's when the northern Israel is carried away. So, so the scattering that's talked about there begins in 723 with the captivity of Hoshea. And in 677, you have the captivity of Manasseh. So he's correct here. Now, in, in BC 677, he says the same year, Manasseh, king of Judah, was carried in fetters to Babylon, and the power of Judah and Benjamin was broken, right? So, so that's going to be Judah. So Judah's going to be Carried, but Judah isn't actually carried away captive in 677, are they? Only Manasseh, the king. So it, it, these periods, the 2520s, begin with the breaking of the pride of power, which is the kingship, not, not with the people be, being taken captive. Now, how long from Manasseh's captivity uh, till uh, the captivity of Judah? When is Judah actually taken captive? Manasseh is taken captive 677. How long till Judah is taken captive? It's going to be 70 years later, right? When Daniel is taken captive and it's going to happen progressively. So we have Daniel's captivity in 607 in the fall of 607, 70 years after Manasseh's captivity. And then we're going to have in 597, we're going to have the captivity of Jehoiachin, right? That's going to be the next one. That's the third seven times. And then finally, we have the destruction of the city and the sanctuary and the captivity of Zedekiah. So even then, these things happen progressively, both with northern Israel and with Judah. OK, so so the starting point here. So Miller's not correct there. He, he, he doesn't understand that for some reason. Now, he's going to go on. So he's going to talk about Manasseh. So now if we can find a fulfillment of these things in the history of Manasseh, we cannot Air, uh, Second Chronicles 33, verse 9 to 11, where it talks about Manasseh being taken captive. This capti captivity took place in the year before Christ, 677. If this is the time when the kings of the earth began to rule over Zion and to scatter the power of the holy people. So obviously he's getting this wrong, the scattering of the power of the holy people. He's, he's not correct because it doesn't start with the captivity of Manasseh. It starts with the captivity of Hoshea. OK, so what he's going to do is he's going to start there and he's going to go to 538 and he's going to count the number of years. And that's going to be 215 years only, which could not accomplish the scattering of the holy people, nor the treading underfoot of the court 42 months or the 1260 years. And this is the reason why John was not to measure, because it would not be fulfilled until mystical Babylon should wear out the saints. Now. So there's some things here he gets partly right and some things he gets partly wrong. So what he's going to do is he's going to say, so the papacy is carried captive in 1798 when the kings 
again took their power and will now accomplish the scattering of the holy people by reigning from A.D. 1798 to 1843, which is 45 years, add which to 215, which the kings had reigned before the mystical Babylon obtained the power, and we have 1260 years of the king's reign scattering the holy people. Now, you can see that this is incorrect. But why is this important for us to understand? What is it that Miller's missing? So he's going to take the 215 years from 677 to BC to 538 AD. And then he's going to say, well, there's 45 years not completed. And this is going to be for uh, the sanctuary. So he's going to put this 45 years from 1798 to 1843. You keep saying 215, but it says 1215. Yeah, 1215. Yeah. Did I say 250? (laughs) Okay. 1215 years, right? So he's taking 1215 plus 45. And so what is, so he's getting this wrong because he doesn't recognize 723 BC as the start. So there's 45 years he doesn't understand correctly. So he's trying to say, well, those 45 years have to come later. I know if you're not used to looking at this, it's, it's not really very obvious. So he's making this mistake, but what what is it he's not noticing? Because he's going to talk about the sanctuary and the host, which is properly the court, where the host stands waiting for the return of our great high priest, who will bless his people. So what is that 45 years actually for? Why, Why are we given this 1290 and the 1335? We're given this period of 45 years. It's on the chart. What does it actually mean? How do we understand it? To me, uh, me the way that I understand is uh, the forty-five. Uh, it's a period of time, uh, specifically me, me like I, uh, yeah, forty-five. But it was supposed to be forty-six, uh, which simply means uh, there's a period of time uh, when we see the rebuild of uh, the temple, when okay. Christ was saying that uh, when you destroy this temple, I'll rebuild it. We find that there's a 46-year period of time because uh, it was in uh, uh, AD. Okay. I, well, I don't agree that it should have been 46. It is uh, 45. Before Christ, which is 45. So it's not yeah, 46 yeah. because th- it's, it's correct on the chart. When you look on the chart and you have 1798 to 1843, we know that the 1335 ends on the last day of it, of the Jewish year, 1843, right? So that's not a mistake on the chart. 1843 is correct. It's just that it's the Jewish year, 1843, that ends sunset on April 18th, 1844. So it still is 45 years as a symbol. And that is the building of the temple. So that's the most important part there, right? So if this is the building of the temple. In order for Christ... In order for Christ to cleanse the sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary, for him to come and to move his ministry from the holy place to the most holy place, he can't just do that out of nowhere, right? There has to be a message set in place for that to happen. We're going to have to come back to this tomorrow. But this is a really important point, and I don't think it's well understood. Why we have Millerite history in the first place, that you just can't have Christ begin his work of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary (coughs) until that message is given in Millerite history. And that's what this prophecy is addressing. And when we understand this historically, we will be able to understand how it applies to us at the present time. And I think this is extremely important. Yeah, Jeff? I was just saying, yeah, that sounds like that would be the key. Yes. So so we're going to spend time on this tomorrow. Okay, but we're a little bit past time. So let's close in prayer. Uh, Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, for the time that we have had this morning. We just pray that as we um, continue to study, um, that you can give light for us to understand our spiritual condition and what it is we need to do to redeem the time. We have a message to give, Lord, to the world, and we know, Lord, that uh, we have not given it, that we have not been prepared, and that it is our sin that hinders this work. Help us, Lord, to focus upon what you are giving us to do 
And we pray for one another that you can help us in our day-to-day struggles, help us in the things that we have to accomplish, and to use our time wisely. Uh, Bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.